Hello everyone, welcome to Talking Logistics where we have conversations with thought leaders and newsmakers in the supply chain logistics industry. So a great pleasure to welcome today's program, Steve Wetter, who is Senior Manager Global Network Planning at CHEP, and Carl Carlos Valderrama, who is VP Customer Success at Lamasoft. And today we're going to talk about leveraging modeling technology for continuous supply chain improvement, the CHEP story. Now, a couple of years ago, uh, I made a prediction that more and more companies we're going to make the transition f and evolve their supply chain processes from being kind of a one-time or once-a-year type of project-oriented uh, engagement to truly making it a continuous business process. And, and certainly CHEP is, is one of those companies that have, has made that evolution and certainly you know, grateful for uh, Stephen to make time to you know, kind of share their experience uh, to date with that, uh, with that journey. And, and, and having Carlos uh, on board as well, he has the you know, he's got a broad perspective uh, in the industry, working with a variety of clients in different industries, um, so really having uh, his perspective as well. So I appreciate him being on the program. I uh, just want to remind all of you that are joining us live today that part of our goal here at Talking Logistics is to make this conversational. So if you've got a question uh, for Stephen or Carlos as we're having our conversation here, you can do so via the uh, the, the Q and A button, and uh, I'll keep an eye on the questions that come in. And if it's a good and appropriate question, and uh, we've got time, I'll, I'll certainly you know weave it into the conversation. Uh, just a reminder that in order to ask a question, you do have to watch this episode on the Google Plus event page uh, to be able to ask that question. Uh, so with that, uh, Stephen, Carlos, welcome to the program. Thank you, Adrian. Appreciate being here. Thanks, Adrian. Appreciate being here as well. Ready to talk design. Great, great. Well, th again, thank you both uh, uh, for making the time. Uh, Stephen, uh, you know, kind of we, before we dive into the conversation, um, you know, I always like to ask my first-time guests, you know, how and why they got involved with, you know, supply chain and logistics, and and try to get a sense of, you know, um, you know, what your current role and responsibilities are, are there at CHEP. So why don't you briefly tell us a little bit about your career path and and kind of your role there at CHEP? Sure. So, uh, <clears throat> you know, I graduated school with a with a chemical engineering degree uh, and realized that I didn't really want to be a chemical engineer. Uh, and so from there, I kind of went into IT consulting for a little bit. It was sort of through the, through the whole dot com boom, that kind of stuff. Uh, and after doing that for a little while, you realize that that traveling kind of gets old uh, after you're doing it, you know, twenty four seven for <clears throat> for so many years. Uh, and so from there, I went back and got my MBA and then started looking for companies that, that I could stay a little bit more local and not travel quite so much. And that's when I ended up find, finding CHEP. Uh, so it was a really uh, you know, a bit serendipitous that I, that I found CHEP, uh, started off as an asset productivity analyst, uh, and my second role got into raw materials planning. Uh, and so in raw materials planning, I started as an analyst, moved up to a supervisor. Uh, and from there, I really kind of got hooked on supply chain as something that I found very interesting, uh, really applies a lot of the, the learnings and sort of the mathematics, the numbers, those types of things that I had through my, my engineering, really leaned on a lot of the, the financial aspects that I learned through the, through the MBA school, and then just kind of progressed through the, through the organization, uh, went through the Lean Six Sigma group, became Black Belt certified with CHEP, uh, and then came back into the uh, the supply chain group, back into uh, some planning functions, held a couple different roles uh, before eventually landing in my current role uh, as the senior manager of global network planning, uh, where I have responsibility around supply chain design uh, for CHEP from a global standpoint. Uh, now, I do have a counterpart that works out of our Madrid office, uh, and our two teams form essentially the two centers of excellence that we have within the CHEP global community around supply chain design. Uh, now I generally take primary responsibility for North America, she takes primary responsibility for Europe, and then for the rest of the world we uh, we sort of tag team and figure out who has the available bandwidth, who has the, the ability to, to help and run some studies for some of those other groups. Yeah, no, in, in, interesting background, you know, uh, I actually started my career as a, as a material science engineer, so you've, you've got a chemical degree, I've got a material <laughs> science degree, right, and, and here we are, you know, somehow you know, two engineers end up in the supply chain and, and logistics industry. Uh, and, and I think, you know, interestingly enough, I think we've had others on the program here over the past three years that have started their career in, in, in engineering. Um, so, so you touched upon a little bit about your organization there. I want to get to that in, 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 in a moment. But um, first, you know, like I mentioned in my opening remarks, you know, one of my predictions from a couple of years ago was that, you know, more companies would, you know, treat supply chain design as a continuous business process instead of a, a standalone you know, project or a, you know, kind of a once a year, you know, exercise. 
and, and you know, Chep has gone through that journey and, and evolution. Can can you compare and contrast kind of how you approach supply chain design uh, today versus how you did it in the past? Sure. So, uh, um, you know, when I when I sort of took on this role, it's been a little over two years now. Uh, we are still primarily doing the uh, the project based approach. Uh, and so, when we talk about the project based approach, uh, we have sort of a standard methodology that we generally follow, where we're going out and we're we're scoping the particular project. We're trying to understand what's the business questions we're trying to answer. We're going through a data gathering phase. We're building validation models. Uh, we're then identifying the uh, uh, the optimized solution, and then from there, presenting out business business case and then eventually moving into implementation. Uh, and I'm not, it's not to say that we have 100% gone away from that approach. We still use that approach for some, uh, uh, for maybe some smaller regions, for some parts of the business that uh, where, where maybe that once a year is, is still sufficient. Uh, but what we are finding, particularly in some of the larger CHEP regions, uh, where we're a bit more mature from a, from a pooling perspective, uh, is that the number of changes that were ongoing at any one time, you know, it might be 5, 10, 15, and it started becoming very difficult just to keep up with all the changes that were going on. And so when we go in and try to run this project-based approach, you know, where do you draw the line? What do you consider as, as uh, your baseline? Is it all based on historical? Do you include future? How much future do you include? And, uh, and then how do you deal with then the changes as they go through? Uh, and so really we started this about a, about a year or so ago. Um, where we just said, look, instead of continually trying to refresh this, this big bad model, what if we continue to make little improvements to the model? So as we, you know, this particular facility increases capacity, uh, as uh, this particular customer grows, as we gain more supply in this particular area, uh, how do we just continually make those incremental changes to the model so the model is able to accurately reflect reality uh, so that when, it, when a supply chain design question comes up, we can query that model in order to, to help us get that answer. And when I compare and contrast the two methodologies, uh, the continuous improvement allows very fast uh, answers to questions as they come up because the model's already built. It's already there and it's a matter of just creating some scenarios against that model in order to get the answer of what your solution looks like. Whereas the project-based approach, um, you know, is it's it, it can take, you know, three months, six months to, to really get that model fully up and running and have all the, the results fully vetted. Um, now that's not to say that the continuous improvement doesn't have some, some downsides associated with that as well. Uh, there certainly are, uh, I think there's more resources required in order to, to maintain that model and, and to keep it up to date, which again is why we're probably using that more with our, our larger regions and our, our, our bigger networks rather than the smaller networks. Uh, and the second thing is I think there needs to be some business trust to make that transition. Uh, because when you're when you're in the project-based approach, there's that validation phase uh, where you're really able to to gain the trust of the business that the the model is reflecting reality, that that you're aligned to historical financial information and all those types of things. As you really move to this continuous improvement type model, you kind of lose that validation model connection a little bit, and so the business needs to trust the supply chain design team that they are still accurately modeling the network, uh, knowing that you don't have that, that validation model necessarily to lean against to, to, to drive that trust. Wow, a lot of, a lot of uh, great information there and, and, and food for thought. You know, the last point you, you raised, I want to get back to that, you know, later in the conversation in terms of, you know, making that connection with uh, with the business group, if you will, particularly, let's say, the CEO and the CFO and, and, and kind of making that connection with the, uh, uh, the, the business performance. Um, but something else you touched upon uh, as well, in terms of you know making that transition. I mean, were there any you know major changes in in, in um, deploying an organizational structure, right, to support supply chain design, you know, globally? And then how was this deployed? You know, now you know from from a team standpoint. You mentioned center of excellence, I think, in your opening comments. Mm -hmm. I'm just gonna you know curious in terms of the organizationally, how, how were you organized? How, how did you go about setting this up? So. Uh, <clears throat> 
Chep really got involved in the in supply chain. Well, let me back up a little bit. Um, so before Chep engaged with Llamasoft, which was probably about five years ago, we were using some other tools for network design, uh, particularly in uh, in certain regions of the organization. Uh, but what we're really struggling with is just the time that it took to go through and evaluate these different opportunities. Uh, and so what we're seeing, you know, it might take a week or two for every little opportunity. Uh, and you know, there was a there was a time built that went out, you know, six nine months of of where all the opportunities were slotted in. So someone had an idea, they had to wait six or nine months before it ever got evaluated. Uh, and so when we started looking at how are we going to change this, uh, you know, we started looking at LlamaSoft and Supply Chain Guru as a tool uh, that you know doesn't require some of the the DBA sort of back end skill work, and really more supply chain professionals can use it using more traditional things like Excel. And you know, eventually we moved to SQL, but um, you know, it's getting a little bit more on the technical side. Uh, but the uh, once we identified the tool, the next thing was sort of engaging the organization to make sure that they fully understood the value of supply chain design. Uh, and that honestly took a, a bunch of work at, at very senior levels within the organization. Uh, and what was eventually stood up uh, was an approach where there was one global head of, of network design uh, who then had two teams or two centers of excellence, one based here in Orlando that, that now I'm leading and one based in Madrid uh, that I have a counterpart that leads as well. Uh, and the idea is that those folks, that they had enough, uh, there were enough analysts, there were enough folks to sort of cross-pollinate ideas, uh, that they were really able to, to become experts, uh, not only in supply chain design, but in, in using the Lamasaw Supply Chain Guru tool uh, to then go out and be able to model various parts of the business in order to, to drive value. And in the very, very beginning stages, I think that there was a lot of reluctance from the business to sort of believe all the results that were coming out of this and, you know, hey, you're telling me to do one thing, but my gut tells me I should do another. Why should I believe you? you know, some of those types of things. Uh, but I think over the course of the five years that we've been doing this, we've built up a lot of trust within the organization, uh, you know, as the empirical evidence has shown that, hey, when you, when you listen to us, you get a lot of savings, right? You get a lot of value, uh, you know, back into the business. Uh, and I think it's that trust that has really now started to allow us to do some, some more things within the business and start making some of these transitions from the project-based approach more to this continuous improvement uh, based approach uh, where we're able to constantly refresh the model and we're really almost looked at as a, as a business partner uh, you know there's very few changes to the supply chain network that occur now uh, that that they're not asking you know me or my team for our opinion first before that change even gets made yeah great uh, great insight there. I love I love the point about you know the the, the building of trust and, and how that's uh, you know evolved over time and and kind of where you are today where you've kind of earned the trust of, of the organization you know with regards to what you're doing in, with supply chain design um, you know Carlos now kind of bring you into the conversation here I mean obviously you work with uh, you know various companies across a, a lot of different industries are, are there common threads between you know Chef's journey and experience and those of other you know companies you work with and and how would you you know characterize the current state of supply chain design overall in the industry and and how it's evolving well <clears throat> that was uh, definitely a, a very good uh, description i mean there's different different ties that i that i can see um let's take it from from the last part that you were talking about about trust uh when we relate to trust we relate to accountability and uh one of the two big things or two big topics that come commonly in, in the industry is how do I make myself accountable or how do I uh, account for the savings that I'm actually being able to get implemented within the business and returning the value to the business and then the other piece is how do I get the questions from the business that I need to answer through design uh, how, how do I, I do that is it a push kind of system is it a pull system do they come with the questions and uh, and uh, to what Stephen was saying uh, there's a combination of things that we see in the industry. There's ad hoc questions that come up eventually, and then there's already a project uh, or a portfolio of, of projects or initiatives that are already been uh, pre-built uh, and that are being refreshed throughout time. Uh, and a combination of those two things is usually what works very, very well. Um, and this is uh, general throughout the, the, in, the different industries. It's not particular to logistics or particular to food and beverage or particular to chemicals. 
I mean, in all the different industries, they're looking at, at these uh, buckets there. I mean, how to gain the accountability, how to get those business questions, and how to set up that combination or the right mix between the ad hoc and uh, what is already predefined or, or pre-built uh, that you need to know to do on a, on a periodic basis. So there, there are definitely some ties there. Um, there's also uh, the question about how do how do we integrate with the organization in order to be able to to harness this uh, capability. And then what we found is that usually companies um, center the structure around uh, five different uh, pillars. One being the connectivity with the business, which we call uh, the business link. Another one being the leadership within that center of excellence uh, that guides those questions from the business or puts those questions from the business into a design that then the center of excellence can then process. Then a data function that basically worries about how do I get this data validated? How do I get the right set of data to build the model? Then a design function that builds the models, builds the scenarios, and does the validation that Stephen was talking about. And then going back into what we call an operational link, which is basically a PMO function that builds an implementation plan and uh, that accompanied by the people from the center of excellence can actually track that this implementation is going on and you're getting the actual results. That I think it's it's what, what we've seen. I mean, what we've been able to identify this as as a as a very robust structure and definitely mirroring uh, what 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 Chef has has uh, has put together. You know, great uh, great points there, um, in kind of that structure that that you talked about. You, you know, in terms of uh, you know listening to both what Stephen said and and what what you said, Carlos. Uh, you know, it seems to me that part of the drive toward uh, moving. Toward a, making supply chain design a continuous business process is, you know, I guess to put it in, in, in today's buzz term, right, is a lot of companies need to make smarter decisions faster, right? And, and the ability to uh, more quickly analyze, simulate, and, and, and really understand the, the, the in, potential impact of, of various scenarios that companies are facing, whether it's uh, scenarios around you know, demand and supply, whether it's scenarios around potential port strikes or, uh, you know, uh, mergers and acquisitions, whatever you, 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 you uh, companies might be facing. Uh, you know, it seems to me that this, this need to make smarter decisions faster is one of the major driving factors in this evolution that's taking place. I mean, w would you agree with that, Carlos? Yes, yes, I would definitely agree. I would add to that to that, uh, the fact that, uh, I mean, the world is ever changing now and everything is very, being integrated and then risk, resilience, these kind of things start also start to, to get into the mix and try to define what my contingency plans would be. So it's not only uh, looking at today, looking at what it would be tomorrow, I mean, my network would look like tomorrow, but also being able to account for this uh, variability as well and uh, to make sure that uh, I'm actually being able also to collaborate with others, with my suppliers, with my uh, third-party logistics with my customers and make sure that we get the most out of that whole design as fast as we can and as reliably, uh, with as much reliability uh, as, as, as we can as well. Great, great. Now, uh, Steve, um, um, kind of to, bu to build on that, right, and, and you know, can, can you share with us, you know, some, some examples of, you know, quote-unquote design thinking you know, in action at, at CHEP and, and, you know, maybe what, what some of the benefits that you have achieved? Sure. So I, I think, uh, you know, some examples are, are very much aligned to, to the points that you're bringing up in terms of having to make decisions faster. Uh, sort of one example I can certainly think of is, uh, you know, CHEP is, is continuing to get uh, more involved in, in, the, in the collaboration space. Uh, how do we work with our customers? How do we work with our suppliers uh, so that we can take supply chain costs out of both our networks, right? Uh, and and what we're finding in that collaboration space is that uh, you know you, you don't have the time to sit around and wait three six months for an answer, right? It's when an opportunity comes up, you need to evaluate that opportunity, and you need to move quickly in order to take advantage of that particular opportunity. Uh, and so that that collaboration space is one, I think, one of the things that uh, you know really seeing benefit with moving towards this continuous improvement process is that uh, by having that full network fully modeled uh, that you know closely represents the 
reality today. Uh, when those collaboration opportunities come up, uh, we're very quickly sort of honing in and, and running the model given those particular changes that collaboration opportunity would afford so that we're very quickly to able to get that answer. Uh, and so what we're seeing is where in the past uh, you know, it may have taken us months to either uh, build up the analysis by hand using Excel spreadsheets or, or having to go through that full project-based approach. Uh, now within the matter of, of days or weeks, we're able to uh, not only get the, get the result in terms of the supply chain impact, but then also work with the folks to build the business case uh, in order to gain whatever approval or things like that are needed through the business to, to facilitate implementation. Uh, so I think it's that speed to market is something that, uh, that this change is really helping from an overall supply chain standpoint. Great. Uh, you know, certainly collaboration is, is, is one of those, uh, you, know, uh, you know, key areas that uh, going back to making smarter decisions faster is one of those key areas that I tell companies is that you, know, you really have to start walking the talk on collaboration now, right? I mean, mm -hmm. a lot of folks have been talking about it for so long, but now, you know, truly to get to the next levels of, of performance in light of all the, the, the change that's taking place in the industry, you really have to, you know, uh, uh, walk the talk. And obviously, you know, supply chain design is, is a platform, if you will, and a discipline uh, to, you know, to be able to do that, uh, you know, mm -hmm. more, more effectively. Um, you know, uh, Carlos, just kind of shifting gears uh, to, to you now and going back to, you know, something that uh, Steve uh, mentioned uh, early on with regards to, you know, validating the business case, if you will, or the, or the business uh, benefits. I mean, how do I make the business case for supply chain design to the CEO and, and, and the CFO in, in the company? And, I mean, what, what are the keys to, um, you know, success to make sure that the promised benefits uh, are actually realized? Uh, that's a very good question, um, Adrian. So what, what, what we've seen um, when building these business cases is actually planning out everything for the longer term, maybe two or three years ahead, and looking at uh, four different areas. One is being able to link your supply chain design uh, strategy with the actual supply chain strategy of your company. A second one is making sure that you actually have the right um, uh, organizational structure in place so that you can walk through this business link all the way to the operational link that we were talking about before. Um, and also to make sure that you have a very clear roadmap of what initiatives or what projects are actually going to be run and what will be the estimated um, both investment and return that you would get from each one of those different projects. If you have a very sound schedule of what you might have for the next two or three years regarding those projects, you have the overarching technology that will support you in order to be able to get there and you have the resources that you would need in order to be able to develop all those projects and all that is tied into the strategy, then you definitely have a very solid case that, that you can propose to, to, to the CEO. Yeah. Customers that we work with in order to be able to build this business case have been very successful in actually providing the right space and the right traction for the centers of excellence within, within companies. And, and this is key. Because uh, as much as you can prove that you are supporting the overarching supply chain strategy with this initiative, the better. And the more that you can account for your actually implemented uh, benefits, the better. We talk about general benefits that we see from our customers that we've done in, in, in service that we do on a yearly basis. We see that uh, benefits from a center of excellence go beyond $10 million a year, year to year. Uh, significantly beyond. I mean, 70% of, of the customers that we survey uh, have more than that on savings that they bring to, to the table. Um, so there's a, a big potential here uh, and setting up that type of plan very well structured is, is certainly the right way to go and certainly uh, part of, of, of what uh, Chep has done. Great, great, uh, great insight there. And, uh, you know, so Steve, just, just kind of curious, I mean, from, uh, from your experience and, and kind of the way you operate and, and the way you've earned the trust uh, of the business leaders, um, are there particular metrics or business reviews or ways of reporting that you've established to kind of, um, again, showcase the value and the benefits that supply chain design as an organization, as a, as a center of excellence and so forth, is, is bringing to the organization? Yeah, so uh, on a... On a 
regular basis, we're reporting up what the the total value of the different activities that have that have come out of our of our group are are realizing. Uh, so I'm personally tracking a lot of the stuff in in North America, and then the more, uh, my counterparts tracking a lot of the the stuff in Europe. Uh, and so what that means is is uh, uh, and this is something that that I think has evolved over the last few years is that we've gotten a lot more involved into the implementation of a lot of our recommendations, uh, so that even though we might not necessarily be the the project manager that's that specifically drive the real estate decisions or the the capital equipment decisions, uh, we generally have a seat at the table as part of the discussions as all those are being worked out, uh, as any little changes might come up that might require a little tweak to the design or, or some of those those types of things. Uh, but what that also means is it allows us to to understand what are all those specific actions that are now being implemented as a result of our recommendations, uh, and it allows us to stay on top of uh, where are they on an implementation standpoint, and then once implemented, uh, what kind of value are they delivering to the business? Are they in line with our original expectations, or, or are there some differences? And if there are differences, why are those differences? Uh, and so it's, it's really on a, on a monthly basis, we're sort of tracking this information, uh, and we're sharing that with the business so that everyone's on board with uh, what is that value that our team is bringing back to the business. Great. I mean, I think as is always the case, you know, the ability to to track and measure and then ultimately communicate, uh, you know, the value and the benefits and, and, and provide visibility to what's going on, um, I think is, is always critical here. Um, you know, we're running short on time, so I just want to remind those of you that are joining us live today that, um, you know, if you've got a question, you know, now would be the time to uh, to submit it. Um, you know, Steve, just to, to uh, stay with you for a second here, um, and you already touched upon it a little bit, but maybe you want, you might want to expand a little bit. I mean, obviously, technology is, is a key enabler, right, of uh, supply yeah. chain uh, design uh, processes. Um, I mean, when you were evaluating, you know, solutions and, and partners, I mean, what were some of the, the key capabilities that you were looking for to, to, again, help enable your organization to move supply chain design into a, a continuous business process? and and ultimately, you know, what were the factors that led you to select, you know, LlamaSoft as a partner? Um, so again, we've been using LlamaSoft for for many years now. I want to say four or five years, somewhere in, in, in that, that aspect. And when we were going through that selection process and, and trying to understand uh, what was the tool that, that we were ultimately going to move forward with, I think some of the keys that we were looking at, um, one was from a, what is the skill set that's required to use this particular tool? Uh, we were sort of coming a little bit from an environment where it was very back-end, sort of database heavy, uh, where the, the folks who were using the tool really needed to be uh, you know, DBAs or, or database administrators. Uh, and so that there was often a little bit of a disconnect between the business and, and the supply chain folks versus the DBAs who are then sort of trying to manage, you know, building the, the models and having them run and those types of things. And so we were really looking for something that was a little bit easier to use where we could have folks uh, more from the supply chain part of the business who maybe aren't quite as technical uh, really being able to use the, the software and being able to understand both the inputs and the outputs and the give and takes and some of those types of things. Uh, I think the, another thing we're looking for is flexibility. Uh, we have a tendency to, at least within our business, and I'm sure we're, we're not alone in this, in terms of asking a lot of what if questions. You know, what if we do this? What if we do that? What if we do both? What if we do neither? What if we have to do this first option? Well, what if we three quarters do this second option? Uh, and so the, the ability to be able to run lots of those what if scenarios to understand, well, what is uh, sort of that, that optimal solution and how that sort of plays against some of the other factors for evaluation. Uh, and then I think the, the third thing, and, and maybe this ties into a little bit on, on the second, is we needed to get answers faster. Uh, and I think that also ties with, you know, we, we need to be making smarter decisions. We need to be making those decisions faster than, than we have in the past. Uh, so where it was taking weeks and months to sort of run single scenarios, uh, we needed something that, you know, we, we could bring that down to days and hours. And, uh, you know, now we're, we're measuring model runs in, in minutes, right? Uh, so I think some of that is is the technology uh, from, uh, from a LlamaSoft standpoint in terms of how we were going about selecting that tool. Uh, and then, of course, as we've continued to use that tool, I think we've become smarter in terms of uh, how to build those models, how to maintain those models, uh, so they're able to squeeze that runtime down even further, uh, so that now we're able to to get answers in you know hours or days, whereas before it was taking weeks and months. 
a great great points there. I mean, I think that the first point you made, I think, is is something that I've I've seen as well. You know, this um, uh, you know, from a usability standpoint, and really, you know, I think it, it used to be in the past. I think one of the the, the challenges that some companies faced is that. You know, to your point, you almost needed a PhD in, in operations research, or you needed a, you know, a heavily, you know, d database type of background. Um, whereas I think what you've seen, what I've seen over the past few years, is you know the ability for you know the business folks, the supply chain folks, to actually now become users uh, of this application, but thanks to, you know, the 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 investments that software vendors have made in making in usability and the user experience, and in really you know, uh, 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 putting all of that complexity in the background, if you will, mm -hmm. as opposed to the uh, as opposed to the foreground. Um, so, so to that point, Carlos, kind of to, to shift to you. I mean, obviously, the scope and capabilities of, of supply chain design solutions that you know continue to expand and uh, and improve. You know, as evidenced by you know some of the new solutions that that Lamasoft has introduced, and you know, as well as some of the acquisitions that that you know the company has made uh, over the past year or two. I mean, what's what's next? For, for supply chain design technology, I mean, what's what's the what's the next frontier? That's a good question, um, and uh, definitely, I mean, moving uh, along the lines of of uh, uh, making people uh, more productive and being able to run all the models faster and run more models and run more scenarios, um, but also working on uh, what makes it possible for uh, users to focus their project more on the analysis and on getting more value out of it than on actually building it and getting it ready. Um, so we've uh, we've done a significant investment in making sure that we have the right set of tools so that that piece of, of the whole project actually minimizes. And then uh, you actually get to focus more on the analysis and then provide tools that allow you to analyze the results uh, graphically, that allow you to share and collaborate those results with different people within the organization. And also, if you're building a model, that you're able to actually share that model uh, and have a lot of people be able to run different scenarios without having to build it or having to uh, adjust it or change it, but just being able to run some of those scenarios and get more insight. So you start getting like more bang for the buck for each model that you're actually uh, getting out there. Uh, you're able to provide better visibility. And then from the user perspective, trying to make sure that um, the user uh, can easily put together uh, this whole packet and can easily tell a story to their executives uh, whenever they, they, they're running a model. And that story should be compelling. I should be filled with uh, uh, graphs and, uh, and visuals that enable uh, the, the, the business to take advantage of those insights, which are for sure a lot of them that you can get from a single model. Um, so that this is where, where things are moving. So it's uh, further visibility, uh, faster running times, uh, more capability on being able to actually put together the models, work with the data, and get that uh, analyzed and get that validated, and be able to put together all this set of projects or project roadmaps uh, faster and uh, with higher impact to the to the organization. Yeah, I, I love the point about you know. Uh, um, uh, kind of investing more time on the analysis, if you will, mm -hmm. versus having to build, you know, having to build a model, right? I think that's that's where I, I think the scales were. Uh, you know, you can argue that the scales were tipped in the other direction. It took so long to build the models and refresh them, uh, as we have talked about our conversation here. And and by the time you went to do the analysis, it, it was probably, you know, the, the the it didn't matter what the answer was because you needed that answer, you know, last month, right? And I, I guess you know moving that that scale, you know, in the other direction, I think is a is a key uh, objective uh, uh, moving forward. Uh, you know, it looks like we're we're kind of uh, uh, running out of time here, so I'm just going to go right to my last question. And and Stephen, I'll, I'll have you uh, answer first, and then Carlos, you can um, you know add your perspective as well. Um, you know, again, as, as a way to wrap up, I mean, what what advice would you give to you know other companies um, that are just beginning, you know, their their journey in supply chain design or are, are transitioning, you know, moving away from kind of treating it as a as a once a year project based type of engagement toward making it a, a continuous business process. Stephen, your thoughts? 
Well, I think as as you're moving from, uh, well, I guess first first to start off, uh, I think if you're just starting off in in the supply chain design space, I think the project based approach is probably the the better way to start. Uh, it's a better way to to make sure the business is following you along as you're uh, building the model and going through that validation process. And and I think that that's probably an easier way to get going. I'm a big believer in the in the concept of the center of excellence. Um, you know, by having multiple people with the knowledge, not only to use the tool, but also versed in supply chain design, uh, they can play off each other, they can learn off each other. Uh, if, if one person happens to move elsewhere within the business, uh, you're not losing all of the knowledge there, and, and you can bring new people in, you can train them up. Um, and then I think going from that, uh, going from that uh, sort of project-based approach over to the continuous improvement. Uh, you know, when I think of uh, the first thing is making sure that you have trust in the business uh, and that you have a track record of, of uh, delivering on the results that that you're promising. And I think once you build that trust, then moving to the continuous improvement, uh, a few things in my mind is really around uh, you know making sure that that you have the the right people that are that are capable of doing that. Uh, and in, and in what I'm meaning by that is. Uh, I think from a CHEP standpoint, it really helped that both myself and quite a few of my team members sort of grew up within the CHEP supply chain. Uh, and so we're sort of viewed as trusted partners within the supply chain uh, organization. Uh, and I think the second piece is just having very easy access to data so that we're not necessarily relying on an IT department or anything like that to, to provide us data, uh, but we're able to get it ourselves extremely quickly to make sure that we're constantly updating that model. Uh, and I think that, that those things have really allowed us to make that transition and, and those are some of the things that I really look uh, I think other folks should be looking for as they're looking to make this transition as well. Great great thoughts there uh, uh, Carl, uh, uh, Stephen. Uh, Carl, So how are you actually going to transition this into a process eventually? So as you're going ahead and do the project, keep that in mind. Keep in mind that that plan has different uh, um, uh, things that you need to take into account regarding the team that you would build, regarding the organization, regarding strategy, and regarding uh, the technology that you would need to support that. I think that that uh, would be a good add to, to what Stephen said. Great. Well, thank thank you both. I mean, like I, I always say uh, at at the end of all our episodes, you know, we always just manage to uh, you know scratch the surface on, on these topics. But you know, I, I think that we um, you know got some great insights in terms of learning uh, kind of how Chep has made the the, the transition and the evolution uh, and, and kind of the 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 words of advice that both uh, you and uh, uh, and uh, Stephen you know shared to us today. So really appreciate you uh, you know making the time to to be with us today. Um, you know, it seems like uh, uh, Stephen dropped off from, from the call here, but uh, uh, certainly uh, we didn't get any questions live today. But if, you, uh, if you've got any questions uh, for Stephen or Carlos and, and you're watching this episode on demand, um, you can uh, uh, watch this episode on TalkingLogistics.com and post your question or comment there. And I'm sure uh, Stephen and uh, Carlos will be more than happy to answer via that medium. So again, uh, Carlos, Stephen, thank you for, you for joining us today, as well as those of you that joined us live. And I uh, look forward to seeing you in a future episode of Talking Logistics. Have a great Thank day. Thank you, Adrian. Have a great day. Bye-bye.